Uh, welcome everyone to our first ever webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Jackie Hike, and I'm from Seroptimist International of Vista and North County Inland. Uh, just a few things before we get started. One, if you have any questions during the presentations, please type them into the chat box. We're going to have a Q&A period after the presentation. Excellent. Let's start all over. And number two, <laughs> I have to let you all know that we are recording this. Uh, entire webinar and we'll be posting it online on our YouTube channel later. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in our month-long fundraiser called 30 Miles in 30 Days to Fight Human Trafficking. We raised over $10,000 and it's not too late to donate. Uh, Osley has typed in, uh, you can text to uh, 3030, the code 3030WALK to 44321 on your cell phone to donate, or you can go to our website at seroptimistvista.org uh, to donate, and it will be shutting down February 1st. So you, there's still time to donate. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the president of our Seroptimist Club, Asli Sayar. Take it, Asli. Hello, my name is Asli Sayar. It's my privilege to be serving as the president of Seroptimist International of Vista, North County Inland. We are one of many clubs that make up the amazing organization known as Seroptimist International of the Americas, which is part of the larger Seroptimist International organization. Our organization is soon to be celebrating our 100th year as a nonprofit. And our focus and our mission has always been to educate, empower, and assist women women and girls in our local community and in our global community. And what we have done in light of the COVID-19 pandemic is we've gotten creative and our annual event to bring awareness and fight human trafficking locally and throughout our entire community has moved online. First of all, we've had this amazing webinar, which we're gonna tell you a little bit more about, but we've also been raising money for the past 30 days as people around the country have gotten together to do 30 miles in 30 days, or if they are sitting on their couch, they're still raising money and still donating. And we firmly believe here at Seroptimist International that the only way and the best way to raise women and girls out of poverty, out of challenging situations, out of violence in their lives is education and empowerment. And that's what we're doing here today. And so what I would like to do is turn things over now to our very own chair of the uh, Prevention Against Violence Against Women and Human Trafficking Awareness Chair, Committee Chair, uh, Kay Van Neville, to tell us a little bit about our presentation today. Take it away, Kay. You're on mute, Kay, so you probably need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Wouldn't you know, I'd be the first one to blow it. Hello again, Kay Van Neville. Uh, personally, I've been working with our Seroptimist Club for 15 years on this issue. We have had live on our feet walks every year during the month of January, which has brought together the community. And we've been able to really spread the word about human trafficking, sex trafficking specifically, men, women, and to our deepest hearts worry are the children. The Seroptimists up here uh, in North County, we are a club and the Seroptimist, um, the Seroptimist Oceanside Carlsbad Club have been working together. We have our own sort of a collaborative up here up north. In the greater San Diego area, there are many members from several clubs who have formed what we call STAT, which means Seroptimus Together Against uh, Trafficking. So we're covering the whole county and we're very, very glad to be able to do that. I think what's important for me to relate to you today are the successes, slow and sure and with great heart, we have moved forward from what's human trafficking to Oh my God, in my backyard, and yes it is. The two organizations who are going to receive um, half of the proceeds of today's uh, event or the month long event are North County Lifelines Project Life and also the Alabaster Jar Project and, and their Safe House Grace House. 
I want you to know a little bit about them so you'll know where your money is going and what it will do. We call this wraparound services. Sometimes that, that statement in itself sort of floats away. But let's put the first and most important one, and then I'm going to list and talk about the others. The first one is safety and security, where for years, in most cases, it's women, and I will simply say women because that is the largest number, and girls, haven't felt safe for however long they've been under the control of a predator. And so finally, when they are able to find the strength to leave what we call the life. There, these two organizations have wonderful outreach services. Gather them up. Project Life's particularly on a 24 seven uh, basis. They are then taken to secure unknown facilities where the services begin. And the first one, of course, as I said, is safety. They then receive specialized therapy. To work well with these women takes much, much training and very specific, specific training to help them through and to get past the horrors that they've had to live. A lot of them are actually what they call, um, well, not service providers, but, uh, they themselves have been through the trafficking uh, ordeal and they are the best ones to help the victims. In addition to the safety, these women begin to actually trust and then they begin to trust themselves and they know that they're able to move forward with the help of a huge community of people who care, give them job skills, and then, you know, just the basics to feed them well. And another wonderful, uh, wonderful aspect for their care is the legal help. These women end up very frequently with a record as a result of them being into slavery. Uh, a lot of the legal services now today, not a lot, there, there's one here in San Diego County. Um, that does uh, pro bono services for these women. And that is a huge relief to them because then they can get out and find a job because they have a record that's actually gone away. Um, I think that it's really important today that comfort and love are or all of these other services. Uh, the Survivor Leads Network, those women have then turned around to victimized and, and rescued women. Um, I am to speak a little bit longer until I see this of Jamie Johnson pop on the screen. She's going to be the next speaker. Uh, Jamie is, as she calls herself, a survived or rather a lived experience. We seem to have lost Kay, but that's okay. I can tell you a little bit about Jamie Johnson. Jamie Johnson um, likes the term lived experience expert. She has had some tremendous experiences in her life, most of which most of us cannot even fathom. And we're hoping she will be able to join us in the next two minutes because she has also turned the trauma and tragedy of her life into advocacy. Uh, setting up her own nonprofit organization, Sisters of the Streets, where she goes out and provides assistance and aid to uh, women and girls on the streets right now who have not yet escaped the life of sex trafficking. Um, she has also become a poet. She has shared at our past walks, for those of you who have attended our in-person in walks, um, poetry of her own making uh, about her experiences, about her emotions, about her fight back and her continued life. Uh, she has a, a son and she is 
wonderful mother to that son and we're hoping she can join us but if she can't we'll take some people out of order and we will instead be hearing as you can see from our panelists here from the amazing monica dean um to tell you a little bit about monica because we might be taking some things out of order today and i appreciate you bearing with us um monica dean anchors nbc's sevens weekday newscast at four and five. So you probably all recognize Monica because you tune into NBC7 and there she is. Um, she delivers NBC7's inspiring San Diego news reports. She joined NBC7 San Diego's new team, news team in June 2004 and won her first Emmy, probably not her last, for her report on the migrant worker camps in Carmel Valley in 2006. She was also awarded an Emmy, second one, for team coverage of 2007 San Diego firestorms and for the coverage of the 2016 riots at the Donald Trump rally in downtown San Diego. Monica grew up in San Diego, the daughter of a Navy captain and a dental hygienist. Monica is passionate about family, faith and community. She is married and th has three children. And so if Monica is willing to unmute herself, we'll take a few things out of order and I will turn the time over to Miss Monica Dean to tell us more about the fight against human trafficking right here in San Diego. Monica, take it away. Oh, thanks, Osley. And I hope that when Jamie gets connected with the webinar here, we can hear from her because she is such a strong and powerful voice and someone with lived experience who I have had the pleasure of spending a lot of time. And she was a contributor to a big project that uh, we launched this past year that I'm gonna tell you about here in just a minute. But really what an honor and a pleasure to be here on what is really just a glorious San Diego day after the rain. If you are here locally, you were living through the rainstorm yesterday, which is unusual for us, but what a sense of renewal a day like today brings. And that's really in part why we're here raising awareness about human trafficking so that the lives of those impacted by the storm of human trafficking can be renewed and strengthened. So that light may brighten their days emerging from a life of darkness. Now, most of you have heard probably that this past year, our NBC7 year long investigation into sex trafficking and exploitation stolen was released. And I want to start by saying that I am incredibly grateful to survivors and those with lived experience like Jamie Johnson, who shared their hearts with us through the Stolen Project so that others can really have a real life look at this problem from the perspective of those who lived all aspects of this story. And Jamie, I don't know if you've logged in yet, but you continue to inspire me. You and others with lived experience, you are truly the heroes of Stolen. And I thank you for that. This project took us to places and allowed us to uncover data that was never before seen by the public. And if you aren't aware, our work culminated in a seven episode video series called Stolen. There are 15 articles, interactive content online, a companion podcast, and just this past week, the feature length documentary version of our project went live on NBC's free Peacock app for the world to view on demand. So I'm so honored to share with you today how this project really got started because truly the first moment of inspiration relates to today's event. Nearly two years ago, the Seroptimist Together Against Trafficking, you just heard about them, or STAT organization, held an award ceremony. It was in March of 2019. And I was honored to be recognized for my work as a journalist, shining a light on this dark issue of sex trafficking, along with a host of others who were committed to this cause. Seroptimists are really good about that. In fact, you may know that Seroptimist International has made a huge commitment to use their platform and resources to help combat sex trafficking. The STAT organization officially was formed in 2011, which brought together a, a number of chapters to respond to this overwhelming need. I remember at that award ceremony, the humble room and the small but diverse audience of all ages and backgrounds. There were kids from high school being recognized there. There were people who had worked decades paving trenches in this field to try to save others' lives. My husband and my parents were there. They were faithfully there, the three of them. And, and we just looked around at all of these people who were working tirelessly to help provide solutions, outreach, healing, awareness, and to answer the call of what is really an overwhelming need. 
the mom on my house. One of the most comprehensive studies on sex trafficking was authored by Jamie Gates and Amy Carpenter from Point Loma Nazarene University and the University of San Diego. I see Jamie Johnson has just gotten connected. So I'm glad you're, I'm glad to see you here, Jamie. I was just saying that you and those with lived experience are really the true heroes of our stolen project. And so it is so, um, it's so gratifying to be able to be here to raise awareness alongside you because you have such a strong and powerful voice. And I just commend you for all that you are doing to further this initiative. And I was saying to give people an understanding of the scope of this problem, the, the study, the comprehensive study by Carpenter Gates showed that between three to 8,000 sex trafficking victims were present in San Diego County alone every year. That's just here. And so that night at that STAT award ceremony in 2019, as I humbly accepted the award, I remember thinking to myself, I don't really deserve this. I mean, what have I really done? I had reported on some TV stories. It was basically what amounted to a few minutes in newscasts here and there, but who was really telling the stories of the people that were in this small room who had dedicated their lives to try to move an issue that felt like a mountain? And I was looking around at the passion and dedication of the people in this small room. It was impressive, but it deserved something more. And that night I was overwhelmed by this calling, a nagging feeling that it was time to take action. And I said that night in my acceptance speech of that award, that as a journalist, I often feel like I'm walking around in the dark with a flashlight, shining a light into the dark corners of this world so that others might see. And I promised that my flashlight was getting brighter. This is a problem that's clouded by misinformation and conspiracy theories. It's obscuring the truth and discrediting the extent of the sex trafficking trade. I'm a mom, I've got three school age kids. And the more people with whom I spoke, the more I found that parents, friends, the community just wasn't understanding the real issue in a holistic way. Just how easy it was for an exploiter to perpetrate this crime how vulnerable people are online right now. And what makes someone vulnerable are often the things that we can recognize in ourselves. Simple things like the desire for love or attention, or maybe something even more tangible like shelter or food or material things. Who doesn't want those things? That same study I mentioned noted that the average age of recruitment for sex trafficking in San Diego is 16 years old. And after talking with many survivors like Jamie Johnson, in most cases, the exploitation doesn't end when someone turns 18 and is then recognized as an adult. One of our experts, I think, said it best when she said that trafficking is like a fever, a symptom of something critically wrong below the surface. So after that STAT award ceremony, I went back to the newsroom and I began writing an outline to pitch a project to the NBC7 senior leadership that would be unlike anything we'd ever done. I pled with them, just let me report. Let me gather elements over an extended period of time and see what takes shape. So I continued to anchor the news at four and five and continued to fill my weekly duties. But I started this project on the side because I felt like it was just the right thing to do. Because I'd been blessed with this platform to reach others and this was an area that needed to be exposed and revealed. I was on a mission. Now, if someone had told me that it was going to take a year and a half going on two years, I probably would have been extremely intimidated. But I started climbing this mountain one step at a time. I started networking, phone calls, meetings, making inroads with survivor support groups, law enforcement, people with lived experience. And with the help of an inquisitive and skeptical executive producer, Tom Jones, we started looking for evidence because Tom knew that if this problem was as huge as people reported, there had to be undeniable proof that we could show to the audience. I was grateful for this small, talented, creative team by my side, Tom helping me dig for information. Information, by the way, that is difficult to find and in many cases, hard to get because how do you locate proof of a crime where the victim often doesn't call 911 because they've been manipulated in such a way that they don't even understand that they're being exploited? We filed public records requests. We reviewed court records, databases. We requested information from child welfare services. 
We started setting up interviews, going on video shoots. We ended up shooting more than 40 hours of video. We went on ride alongs. We listened and cried along with survivors and family members as they shared some gut-wrenching stories. We spoke with traffickers, sex buyers, advocates, all to understand the how and why behind everyone who is impacted by this issue. There was a lot of brokenness, and isn't that just part of the human condition? But it was our goal to help people see the true human side of human trafficking. Reporting the story took a huge emotional toll. I cried with survivors. I lost sleep thinking about how would I tell these stories, but it pales in comparison to what they've lived through. And every tear strengthened our resolve to do our best to be accurate and fair and truthful in our reporting. And when we started thinking about how are we going to tell this story, we didn't know exactly how to organize this massive amount of information and video that we had amassed. I started outlining, logging video, writing, and then the day before my executive producer Tom Jones and I were set to strategize on how we would go about doing this, we had a critical meeting with a senior NBC executive who said, you know what, forget about TV, break it up in episodes and tell the best stories you can so that people can binge watch it online like Netflix. So we got into that conference room the next day and Tom and I, day by day, hour after hour, week after week, weeks turned into months, we wrote, we talked, we listened, we screened video and our vision took shape. And just as we were nearly ready for launch, the coronavirus pandemic dispersed our newsroom and as stolen was temporarily put on hold, our story continued to evolve. So we knew we had to adapt and reset. We had to have faith that the timing of the release of Stolen would just be perfect. So our major findings, the coronavirus pandemic ended up putting children at even greater risk of exploitation. Our report offered vivid firsthand examples of how traffickers use social media to befriend, manipulate and coerce their victims. We had new documented evidence of sex trafficking and exploitation in nearly every school district in San Diego County, information we had to fight to share with the public. We reported the truth that most trafficking cases aren't instances of stranger danger, but the exploitation begins with someone in a position of trust. We learned that boys are also victims of sex trafficking. We learned risk factors and warning signs that we share through our reporting. We revealed that trafficking stems less from San Diego's location along the US-Mexico border, as many believe, and instead is linked to tourism, conventions, sporting events, military bases, and our region's overall financial wealth. And through participation in undercover ride-alongs with law enforcement, we shared new details about the significant shortage of law enforcement available to fight the problem, combined with a lack of survivor resources and shelter care, despite years of national and local warning signs. North County Lifeline and Alabaster Jar Project were part of a roundtable discussion shining a light on just how great the need is and how they are scratching the surface to meet that need. Organizations like Jamie's Sisters of the Streets that's providing outreach to people who are living the life on the streets and offering them an opportunity at a new way out and hope. We exposed gaps in the California justice system that allow sex buyers to face little to no penalties. Where is their role in all of this? And what kind of penalties are they facing? So on the evening of August 19th, 2020, as I sat right here in my home studio, this is my guest bedroom turned anchor studio with my computer screen on much like it is now. It was close to midnight and I was down here in the room. I could see each element of our project change color as it was activated to go live for the world to see. What we had produced was finally going to be released to the public. And wouldn't you know, at that very moment, and I was emotional getting here by myself. My family was upstairs asleep, so I was down here alone. My phone lights up with a text message from who? Jamie Johnson, expressing that she was proud that we had been faithful to that call, that call that came the night of the STAT Awards ceremony a year and a half prior. So since Stolen's release, we've heard from viewers who are now confronting their past abuse for the first time. Some are now gaining the courage to seek help for the consequences of that abuse. 
Educators are sharing our work with their students. In fact, just this week around the dinner table, my high school age daughter told me at dinner, mom, guess what? My friend who goes to a different high school watched episode one of Stolen in class today. Parents have thanked us for helping arm them with information to protect their families. And lawmakers, academics, advocates, and public officials from across the country have acknowledged our journalistic accomplishment and pledged to do more to keep kids safe. But most of all, I'm grateful that the survivors and those with lived experience are sharing our work to help others understand this issue. And that is most rewarding to me because they are the heroes of this story because they've lived it. I believe this information has the potential to save someone's life. And that's why it makes me so emotional. And I applaud the Seroptimus organization for their efforts to help combat sex trafficking. Because as I say in the documentary, do not underestimate the power you have to use your platform for good. Look around and see what you can do to be part of the solution. It could be something as simple as a conversation with a child, a neighbor, or a friend, but protecting others from exploitation, restoring what's been stolen, starts with us, and we can all play a role in answering that call. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jamie Johnson. Thank you, Monica. It's always so good to see your face. You're always looking so beautiful, and I'm like, your lighting is always perfect. I don't know how it happens, but thank you. And thank you for all the work. You know how I feel about just all the work and dedication that you put into this um, and your team. And I see Tom is on here and just um, shout out to you guys. I apologize. I'm like on dual, dual events. So I have one screen going and I'm over here. So Thank you to everybody who's here. Um, I just didn't want to miss an opportunity. It's been kind of become a personal tradition to be able to come and speak at this event um, for what is this year three, I think, or four? Year three, I don't know, whatever. It's been more than two times. So it's a, it's a tra tradition now. So I just wanted to share a poem. Um, and just with the pandemic, um, you know, poetry has been really just healing for me and I think like all of us last year I went through probably some really great things but also some really just difficult things um, with isolation and just trying to figure out moving and trying to figure out where my place is and I looked up and noticed that this pandemic that a lot of people were living in a space that so many survivors have been living in. And so I felt like this was the first time in about 10 months that I was able to write anything. So I wanted to just share share with you guys. Um, are we, am I, is it my turn? Am I good to go? Okay, <laughs> all right. So this is called the pandemic. <clears throat> Isolation, fear, and confusion. Never knowing what tomorrow holds, wondering day to day if today will be the last. Watching life pass from behind a wall sickness of the body but also of the mind and soul there's no telling when you when your time to fall truly is this is the pandemic mind's going crazy wondering if today will be your last will you ever see your family again what about the kids will things ever go back to the way they were before this will you ever feel normal again this is the pandemic traumatized by fear anxious for the future stuck in the stillness forced upon you wondering what's next fearing what's to come, wishing for what was, this is the pandemic. Nowhere to turn because it seems no one cares. Rightfully so, as they're all trying to survive themselves. Gasping for air, wishing the days would stop passing while nothing changes. Feeling the aches in your body, praying they would just stop. Trying to push the heaviness off your chest and stomach. Just wanting a full breath of fresh air. Trembling from the shakes, just wanting your body back. This is the pandemic. And although this may feel like something new that 2020 has brought on to all of us, this is the pandemic of sex trafficking and the trauma that we have been experiencing, experiencing since before COVID-19. Uh, I just wanted, for me, what I realized, um, thanks. Um, what I realized is something that was such a blessing, I think, and a disguised blessing. Um, of the pandemic was that it put us all on this equal playing field, right? Like it put us all on a certain level where we all had to dig deep to understand empathy. Um, and for those of us that want to understand 
the effects of PTSD, want to understand the effects of survival, want to understand the effects of those that deal with sex trafficking daily or deal with trauma daily. The, the feelings that you get from the pandemic are just that, um, that every day of just living and not knowing what tomorrow brings, that is the feeling that I can closest help anybody identify with that doesn't experience this firsthand. And so when we can put ourselves in people's position, in, in that position to where the pandemic is much trauma and as much hurt that it has brought, if we can look at the silver lining and understand that if this hasn't helped us see humans as just humans and see that overnight we literally can be put all in the same position um, regardless of finances regardless of religion regardless of sex regardless of past experiences if this hasn't opened our eyes to understanding that nothing is a that person problem over their problem his or her problem that we are all each other's responsibility then I think that we are just too far disconnected with humanity. But I'm hoping and I'm seeing the hope in what the pandemic has brought. And the hope is that we can see each other as ourselves and we can see each other as human beings. And therefore that is going to lead naturally into the solution of things that plague us like sex trafficking and addiction and housing and security and trauma and all the things that we say we hate so much. Um, and so just dig, I encourage everyone to just dig deep and understand your emotions and allow them to relate to those um, in finding, when you're identifying those emotions in yourself, um, that is how you help others um, heal from the things that we, that we say we want to help people heal from. And so Thank you guys for sharing a couple of minutes with me. I think I'm staying on for Q&A in a minute and um, love you all. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day um, and, and to Human Trafficking Awareness Month. All right. Okay, thank you, Jamie. I'm glad to be back. I don't know where I went. <laughs> okay. Uh, Osley, are you gonna maybe pop in here? Absolutely. Jamie, what an amazing poem. And Monica, you nearly brought me to tears telling your story of how you got involved and, and used the power of your platform to investigate and dig deeper, just like Jamie said, and, and shine this light on this horrible pandemic of human trafficking that has existed long before COVID and we're gonna keep fighting it long after COVID. Um, so we do have a couple questions. We did wanna open it up to questions. If you do have a question, please put it in the chat. We had one just as Monica was starting. I don't know whether Monica in her capacity would answer this or Jamie with regard to her knowledge as a lived experience expert with her nonprofit Sisters of the Street would be better. So I open it up to either of you. The question was, um, how, how does one go about determining who the victims of sex trafficking or human trafficking it is because it is so insidious and it isn't just the traditional stranger danger. Monica first, and then maybe Jamie, if you had an answer to that particular question. Jamie, you go ahead and answer first. She, she is, <laughs> yeah, please go first. Sure, so, so I think first, so I think, I think it's a, there's compartments to this question, right? Like I think that first and foremost, we have to understand that there are enough people coming forward needing support and help that we need to address first and foremost before we go out seeking to try to identify who and what are victims. That's not to say that it needs to be overlooked. What that is to say is that we are doing things a little bit backwards when it comes to resources. We are encouraging people to stop living a lifestyle that is helping them survive, literally getting them day to day. Whether that be abusive from our standpoint, looking in or not, we still have to understand that we have not set up society in a way to be able to efficiently and effectively really embrace anybody trying to be encouraged to come out of this lifestyle, right? And so obviously there's a little bit of a difference between a youth um, and an adult, not to say that there's any less of a um, forceful circumstance, but it is to say that 
until we can start figuring out how the resources are going to be provided in a way that is going to prevent the recidivism. Um, and when I say resources being provided, I don't mean just because it looks good. Like, I don't mean just because, so we can say, well, we've housed a hundred survivors this year, but how many of those survivors have been able to move forward into self-sufficiency? And how many of those survivors have been able to, to in that year become figure out and identify the healing within themselves. So we have to stop doing things for numbers and trying to say that we have identified a certain amount of people and really embrace the people right now that are coming forward and self-identifying that we already are, are in plain sight. And then once we're learning to heal that, that population naturally is going to open up a population for others to come forward and see like, oh, it's safe for me to come identify, it's safe for me because there are resources, it's safe for me and it's not risky for me to leave because I have a cushion over here. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and that's just more, I guess, on the, on the, the realistic side. Um, I think that we think awareness is, is identifying and really awareness is self-awareness first and foremost and the awareness of what our realities of our society are um, and are we really ready to embrace in identifying all of these victims and be turning them into self-sufficient survivors are we ready to do that as a community and maybe if i can chime in at this point this is a good sort of launching pad too i, I think um what Jamie said is spot on and it's this systemic problem that can really feel overwhelming too, just for the average person like, whoa, how am I going to meet the need or how am I going to be able to do that? And I think in, in some instances that starts with identifying what those risk factors or warning signs are. So maybe we can meet the needs of those in, individuals uh, beforehand and prevent something. So we created um, on our website, the entire series is available at nbc7.com slash stolen, but we have something called the journey to freedom experience, which is basically like three composite characters that, that take people through uh, exploitation to a, uh, a survivor's path to exiting the life in um, and showcase some of the resources that are available. But I think what's important to identify is some of the common risk factors that make someone vulnerable, whether it's poverty, whether it's a child who's not getting a lot of attention at home, or maybe it's someone who's you know, spending a lot of time online, posing as an amateur model, trying to get the approval of, something, of someone else because that need isn't being met at home. And you know, this isn't gonna be something that one person is going to solve overnight, but maybe if you look at some of the different aspects of this and some of the different vulnerabilities and see what is my skill set and how might I be able to apply something to be part of the solution, whether that's being a mentor for someone who maybe doesn't have a stable parent in their life or, or even just a, a befriend, you know, kind of a sistership or a partnership from some, for someone who's going through some hard times that would create a relationship that would basically help, um, you know, fill that need or that void that's in that person's life that could be filled by someone that was looking to take advantage of them or exploit them. So I hope that uh, helps answer some of the question. Thank you. Uh, that was good. There is one other question, which is um, uh, to both of you again, Jamie and Monica, what, what is interesting is that it isn't the traditional stranger danger. It isn't I'm snatched off the street the way Hollywood likes to dramatize it. Um, and I know from last year's human trafficking walk um, that the local unified school districts were planning pre-COVID to put on educational seminars, parent teacher nights to give parents information. Um, you know, it, it's such a broad issue, but what if anything comes to your mind as to things parents don't know that they should know to watch for? Um, even just, just a few nuggets of information, if either of you have any information there. So just so I understand the question clearly, so uh, identifying factors that parents should be looking for, like avenues of which... Like, like yeah, where, where, where can kids get into trouble? Where should parents, beyond just talking <laughs> to them... Yeah, every, it's everywhere. <laughs> a bit everywhere. disappointing there's, to hear that. Yeah, Literally, like, there's... If there's a conjugation of people, there's an opportunity for vulnerability, right? So I think that instead of focusing on, I don't wanna say instead, but I think instead of honing in on 
where and how it's more of just identifying um where 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 do vulnerabilities exist and that can be as simple as i just when i, I just spoke on a presentation and i encourage people to stop trying to identify the physical vulnerabilities that we can see so like not necessarily categorizing the more vulnerable population because they are foster youth or they are have been formerly incarcerated or they are experiencing abuse yes that adds to it but when we have all these check boxes of this makes you more vulnerable we overlook the fact that you could have 10 vulnerabilities but could be equivalent to one person's one vulnerability and so if my vulnerability is i just desire and crave to be accepted that in itself wherever i go that desire goes and so anywhere that i touch and i reach is the opportunity for somebody to come in and fulfill that vulnerability and so anywhere in our society that there is a person with a vulnerability is an open avenue an open door for that to be filled through grooming or sexual exploitation or abuse or manipulation of any kind and so yes i think that it's difficult to come up with these lists because sex trafficking um manipulation it adapts with the times it, it's adapted with the pandemic it adapts every single day that's why the list of how human trafficking happens it grows went from 24 last year to 27 different types of human trafficking it's probably going to be at 30 by next year there's it adapts and so that is why this is such a complex issue and so instead of trying to identify um and stopping where it's happening i think we need to dig deeper into the roots of the vulnerabilities of why it's happening and if we can learn how to address those within our households and our communities we are actually sending people off with the equipment and the tools to be able to protect themselves from falling vulnerable um, or victimized by that vulnerability being um, fulfilled yeah i think that's well said jamie and um i think that the number one thing that we heard when we talked with all of the people that we talked with throughout our reporting was parents be involved in your kid's life. Parents be present. Don't just know where they are, know what they're doing, know who they're talking to on that device, know what they're posting. And throughout the kind of multimedia platform of content that we produced, we have some resources for parents, like how to have a conversation with your child about sex trafficking. I mean, I think that if we arm our kids with this understanding, they're going to be the first line of defense in many ways because they're with their peer groups and they're going to see what's happening maybe before I will. And so I think that that tool, how to have a conversation with your kids, some apps that parents need to know about. There's actually also been an app that parents can use as as sort of a monitoring uh, platform of, of their, their kids' social media. And it's not just an oversight app. It's actually creates a dialogue between the child and the parent um, about you know, why this might be a risky hashtag you've used or a pose in a picture that you've posted. But I think just that love and presence of a parent who's involved is probably the singularly most important thing that we can do as parents as we're looking to shepherd our kids. Uh, but I would uh, you know, urge you to explore the website that we've created to see some of those tools and the resources. There's also the list of kind of groups where you might wanna get involved, including you know, Jamie's group or Alabaster Jar, North County Lifeline, they're all listed there as well. So it's kind of a comprehensive landing spot on how to get more information and go beyond what you've learned today. All right, we do have one other question before we turn it back over to Jackie to tell us about how our, our walkathon has done. And that question is from a case manager who happens to be an attendee today, who said, how are safe houses handling clients during COVID? Um, I don't know whether either of you have any information about this because as you said, Monica, and as Jamie's poem indicated, COVID has changed everything. Um, but do any of you have any idea of how the pandemic has affected um, uh, helping survivors find uh, resources. I'm going to let Jamie answer that because she is like in the trenches and I have been on the phone with her when she is trying to find someone a place to stay. So Jamie, you've got firsthand knowledge of just what a struggle this has been. So pre-pandemic, it was already very difficult to find housing. Um, shout out to North County Lifeline and Alabaster um, for both having that just two of 
I think the most prominent um, resources housing wise in San Diego. Um, I'm always able to hit up somebody over at Project Life and be like, hey, um, can I refer somebody over to you? And they have always been really helpful. Um, same with Alabaster, their program is amazing, but they can only do so much, right? Like they can only, they have a capacity. Um, you know, just to keep it all the way authentic, um, it has been trying emotionally to try to figure out how to navigate housing. Um, the resource, I'm blessed to be able to provide national resources, so I'm not specified to any area in particular. So I have a plethora of people requesting shelter and trying to just figure out, literally trying to navigate, like going through a list of things that this person experiences um, to try to fit, figure out how do I fit you into whatever resource is available. For example, they may be tra sex trafficking survivors or a victim of sex trafficking, but I have to literally ask them, like, do you have any type of history of domestic violence, any type of history of substance use, any mental health, anything that is going to help me put you in another category to qualify for housing somewhere? Um, and then the issue with finding somewhere is that I've been told, I think about seven times now, that I have to provide two-week quarantine for the person before they can come to the shelter. So there's oh. a bed available but they don't have the funding to provide two week quarantine. And I'm not really a funded organization. Um, and so again, collaboration is so important. I can reach out to places like North County Lifeline and connect the survivor with a case manager that then they can either utilize their emergency shelter or um, hotel. You know, Necessities Polaris has been very helpful with that, but the stress behind trying to navigate it is, is is just that stressful um not only for the person trying to provide the resources but for the person on the receiving end to have to call multiple numbers to figure out just to get denied or be told that things are full um and then have to do two-week quarantine um, by themselves in a hotel which is already probably triggering in itself and then if there's kids in the picture the the added stress that goes into that not to mention the fact that there is a lot of males that have been coming forward lately that there are no resources for um and so what what has it done it has just escalated i've seen more overdoses than i want to have ever had to see with a lot of friends. Um, I've seen more relapses than I want to see. Um, I've seen more relapses into the life and more people just going back to where they're comfortable and where it's they know what is going to happen tomorrow versus trying to wait for unemployment, trying to wait for housing security, trying to wait for all of these things. It's more comfortable to go back to your abusive situation than it is to, to not know what's coming tomorrow. And so it's, it's trying. Um, as I'm sure all of the case managers, all of the service providers, all the direct service providers can can account for, it's um, it's traumatizing and it's stressful. And I think we just do the best that we can, you know, like we just collaborate, we network, and we just hope that humanity is brought back into everybody's hearts and that we just try to do the best we can and help where we can help. And where we can't help, we do the best we can to provide hope and stand next to people during that process so that they don't feel alone, so that that recidivism and relapse um, doesn't have to be as high as it has been. And I think that that's all we can do. I don't know if that answers the question, but it sucks. <laughs> housing sucks. We need housing. We need money. We need, we need you know, we need all that, that stuff. But like I say and preach on my soapbox is the housing doesn't matter if we don't take the first step beforehand of of the self-sufficiency skills and the humanity like if we don't have humanity in our programming the programming is not going to be successful if we don't teach people how to maintain a household and we just throw them into the world and throw them to the wolves they're not going to be successful and then what that does is is discourages them from ever wanting to try again with a program because they failed once and so we have to remember that first step before the housing before the job security before all of these things well said well said jamie thank you so so 
This has been wonderful. Um, I, I would like to now uh, turn it over first to Kay to, to give us, um, excuse me, no, Jackie, I apologize, to give us some uh, an update on how we've done donation wise. Remember, we are taking all of the proceeds from this, 100%. Are going to be divided equally between Alabaster Jar Project and uh, North County Lifeline, which both Monica and Jamie have spoken about. Take it away, Jackie. Okay, uh, I'm uh, looking at the page that shows the most recent donations. We've now reached ten thousand four hundred seventy-three dollars. Oh. Uh, Pam Warnock just donated a few seconds ago. Leland Proemos, Corey Deanda, Amanda May Fitzgerald, and Osley Sayar. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm going to try to share the screen so you can see this in real time. Uh, and then I'll come right back, I guess. Let me try. Uh, I wasn't successful the first time I did this. Share the screen. Okay, share screen. Are we keeping the donation open? Or is there a confusion? Yeah, can you see the screen? Yes, yeah, there we go. All right. Can you see the whole screen or am yes. I in the way? Yes, yes, good okay. picture. So, uh, what is that box? Take that away. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is in real time and I'm not gonna shut down this fundraiser till the morning of February 1st. <laughs> Hoping to get, you know, more money. But uh, when we get a final tally, we'll split the money and present the tech, uh, checks to the two organizations and we'll probably do it during a, an online meeting presentation. And I just want to say, as president of our organization, hats off to Jackie, to Kay, and to the very many members of our club, to Monica Dean, to Jamie Johnson, to everyone at STAT from SI, Oceanside, Carlsbad, and our other sister Seroptimist clubs who've come together during a pandemic year where <laughs> there have been no end of problems and donated. Every little bit helps as both Jamie and Monica have shared. And I do hope you take a look at the resources that we put in the chat. Um, share this page, share those resources, post on your Facebook, post online, call your friends, talk to your nieces, nephews, grandkids, kids, friends, spread this far and wide. There's still time to donate. I cannot tell you, we have exceeded all expectations in donation. Wouldn't you agree, Kay? I mean, absolutely. I'm I mean, we were we were we were hoping for maybe three thousand, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. The generosity has been tremendous, as has the generosity of time and energy and commitment from both Monica from Channel uh, Seven NBC and uh, Jamie Johnson, Sisters of the Streets. I mean, we at Sir Optimus cannot be happier, and we're there trying to address the vulnerabilities with you. We're there with STAT, we're there to bring awareness, whether it's to our Live Your Dream program where we give educational grants to women in our community and Jamie is a past recipient, well-deserved. And uh, through our Dream It Be It program where we work with teenage girls about career and goal, gu goal guidance. So if you wanna get involved in our club, you wanna get involved in Sisters of the Street, you wanna you know, show Stolen from NBC7 streaming now Share this far and wide. This is about education. And that's what Human Trafficking Awareness Month is, to get the word out there and, and um, um, wants to do that. If you want to uh, donate through Fidelity Donor Fund, which requires tax ID and contact person, I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. You contact me right after this, and we will be happy to arrange any special needs donations. Happy to do that on behalf of the club, get you in touch with our treasurer as president, and we'll do what we need to do. All donations are welcome year round, but certainly for our walkathon. Um, Kay, any final words? Oh, well, I just have a thank you that is in, you know, capital letters with uh, all kinds of exclamation marks at the end. I don't know what happened to my own picture uh, a bit ago, but I'm awfully glad to be back. And uh, <laughs> see you next year either on the street or oh that sounds kind of scary <laughs> <laughs> or yeah or certainly uh in a virtual world thank you so much all of you thank you all of you all right then thanks again a big round of applause for monica dean of channel 7 nbc jamie johnson sisters of the street jackie you started us would you like to end us please yes thank you all for coming um 
and I'm going to I'm going to just put up the ending screen with the uh, websites for all these organizations. Yes, and if anyone needs further information, we put a lot of it in the chat, but feel free to reach out to our respective organizations, Jamie, Channel 7, NBC, Seroptimus International, STAT. We're, we're in the fight. We're in the fight and we're happy to work with you. So thank you so much. We're going to keep this webinar open for a few more minutes just so you can take down notes from the chat box. But we are officially done and thank you so much to our presenters and a big round of applause to you. So, okay. Thank you for all you're doing to continue the fight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Okay. All right. And that concludes our first one. Okay. We can stop recording. Yay, ladies. Good, good job, Ashley. Stop recording.